Okay, might as well get going. Um, I hope that you're all here to hear about the infrastructure behind the Servo browser engine. Just um, out of curiosity, how many of you are relatively experienced Python programmers? You've been using it for a job, been using it for more than a couple of years, just by quick show of hand. About two thirds of the room. Anybody here super new, like just coming here to find out more about Python and get started? Few hands, that's totally awesome. It's great to have you here. And just out of curiosity, who has heard of the Rust programming language? Yeah, about half, yeah, two thirds. Um, and who here has heard of the Servo browser engine that Mozilla is working on? So maybe a quarter to a third. That's awesome. So we've got all ranges of expertise and all ranges of knowledge. So some of this will be review for some of you. And um, we'll make sure that we're on the same page about what everything is. So to start out with, my slides are at that link. You're welcome to tweet any questions you have later at me, email me, find me on IRC. I love questions, um, they're great. If I don't know the answer, which I often don't, I can find someone who does and put you in contact with them. So I'm personally the DevOps engineer for the Mozilla research team as my day job, which means that I do Unix things for the people who write um, the Rust compiler and the Servo browser engine. This does not mean I'm a compiler dev, and this does not mean I'm a browser engine dev. If you come to me with questions about those things, my answer is gonna be in the form of an introduction to someone who's actually an expert. So I work on Rust, I work on the browser engine that's written in Rust. How many, what language do you think I do mostly for work? Python. Shell, Python, yeah, you're absolutely right. I would say that my day job is about 80 to 90% Python code because it's really the glue that holds everything together. So for all of you people who are interested in Python, I figured I would just walk through how Python glues the Servo Browser Engine project together. We've only got about 40 minutes here, so with 10 minutes for questions, that's half an hour, and I'm gonna take you on a bit of a whirlwind tour of a variety of things. We'll all get on the same page about what REST and Servo are. We will follow a change through from pull request to showing up in a nightly build of Servo and look at all of the different pieces of automation that it touches. And then we will dig into where you can find the Python code for every piece of that. And I'd like to show you how you can get started either learning some Rust or exercising your Python skills or practicing your Python skills to help the Servo project out. And then, of course, questions and answers. So the way PyDX handles questions is something that's kind of new to me as a speaker. We ask that you write down your question on the little note card if you have it during the talk. And then my awesome room volunteer will pick up the note cards and I'll answer as many as I have time for. So to start off with, the Rust programming language. Um, oh yeah, so one note about these slides, they aren't the prettiest slides I've ever presented, but I got the questionable decision into my head that since I'm talking to you about Servo, I should present from Servo. So, the slides are the same things that we have on my website, and they are running in an instance of the Servo Browser Engine built last night. So um, I apologize in advance if it decides to, as they say, eat our laundry, as any piece of sufficiently experimental software is allowed to do. So the Rust programming language, um, that all the stuff that I'm supporting and that the tool that's showing you these slides is written in, is about a year old, um, Stable came out um, in May 2015, and it's designed to be safe, concurrent, and fast. If you're comparing it to other languages, you're looking for the performance of C or C++, the type system and ability to reason about it of like Haskell, and a combination of safety and speed like nothing that's currently available except for it. Um, so the Servo Browser Engine is worked on at Mozilla and implemented in Rust. And the history of how these two are tied together is that the guy who originally invented the Rust language, Graydon Hoare, was working at Mozilla at the time. And when Mozilla looked at Firefox and said, how can this remain a competitive product for the next 10 years, the next 20 years, what do our users really need? They said, we need to be able to build components that are cutting edge and more performant than we've got right now. And they asked the research team, hey, how are you gonna build these things? And the research team said, no widely available language will meet all of our needs for this. But hey, look, there's Rust. So Rust is not technically owned by Mozilla, just as um, 
Other projects where a company hires most of the core team aren't really owned by that company, but a lot of the REST core team does work at Mozilla on the research um, team. So Servo is a Mozilla project, and it, is, it has two main goals that sometimes seem at odds with each other and that we're constantly working to, um, to resolve. And basically, the goals are to experiment with new browser technologies, try out these crazy things that we haven't been able to try before because it's just too big a code base, too old, too bogged down in decades of bug fixes or what have you, and then also prototype and build components that we can ship straight into Firefox to improve its safety, speed, and performance, which are those things that will really set us apart going forward. So as one example of this, we shipped an MP4 parser in a nightly edition of Firefox that was all written in Rust and prototyped in Servo, and it performed like 99.79% perfectly matching what the C++ one did and performing much more quickly. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking at doing going forward and integrating the two code bases more and more closely so that they can each take advantage of the other's strengths. One thing that you'll see often um, in the Servo project is the um, Doge, which isn't a logo. Since we're an official Mozilla project, we haven't gotten official real logo yet, and we use this cute little guy as a placeholder. Um, that is why it shows up in a variety of places. We're not just really fond of memes. So when you talk about browser engine architecture, again, I'm not an expert on this. Basically, the way that Servo is put together is having a variety of small Rust processes that all interoperate in order to get the website from the thing the server hands you to the thing you see. And so this allows, or this prevents the slowest part of the site from hindering the display of the quicker parts. If you have some script that takes forever, but then you can also display a bunch of text that the script doesn't touch, you can get that text to the user right away and just wait for the script to finish, as opposed to hanging on it the way conventional um, browser engine designs would have to do. If you want to know more about how it's architected or the roadmap for Servo, the wiki on GitHub is kept up to date and well maintained github.com slash servo slash servo slash wiki, and I would recommend videos and presentations to learn more about the guts of how and why it's put together on the Rust side, and also the design document to explain at a higher level what's going on. So um, there's one thing, as we jump into the infrastructure of Servo, that has come from Rust that I think informs most of our design decisions, and this is an idea that the Rust founder, Graydon Hoare, term the not rocket science rule of software engineering. If you've heard my other talks about Rust related things, there's always this slide because I think it is one of the most important takeaways from the project. It is, you should automatically maintain a repository of code that always passes all the tests. And once you've worked on a project that automatically maintains a repository of code that always passes all the tests, you kind of get hooked on that workflow. And you take it and you try and bring it to subsequent projects that you do. And that's exactly what's happened with Servo, as the original Servo authors worked with the REST compiler team, worked on the REST compiler with this workflow, worked on some libraries that used it too. They said, we've got to have this. We've got to keep this when we start um, doing our browser engine. So this is why we have many of the bots that I'm going to show you our first pull request to Servo interacting with. So let's look at that life cycle of a pull request that I promised you. It's going to hit several bots that are pretty important. Um, they're named High Five, Homu, and Bors. The words Homu and Bors are basically synonyms. Homu is the software that runs it. Bors is the name of the bot itself because the original implementation was named Bors. So I hope it's not too confusing that I use those pretty much interchangeably. Um, the mock build tool and also build bot. So let's jump right in. Let's say a new contributor has found an issue to fix on Servo, submitted a patch via pull request. The first thing that's going to happen on that pull request is the high five robot is going to say thanks for the pull request and welcome if they're a new contributor or just thanks if they're returning. Um, they'll say we're excited to review your changes and here's your reviewer. So high five's purposes are basically fourfold. You greet new contributors, assign a reviewer, notify anyone whose modules got touched in that pull request in case there's something tricky that they would know about and warn if there's something that might not be best practices going on. We can see all of these things, although the font has to be a bit small to fit it all on the screen, 
here. So it greets, thanks for the pull request and welcome, assigns, in this case, M. Brubeck in that first commit. It notifies Ki Chang of which files were touched in the parts that he owns. And then it warns, hey, you modified some scripts but didn't change the tests. Is that really the right thing to do? Do you need to add some tests here? And so High Five has done its first job. And while High Five is doing that, some tests kick off. Um, the Travis tests run a Python module that we wrote called tidy, which checks for basically just linting the change. Checks, do you have the right indentation? Are your lines way too long? Do all of, all of your new files that need a license actually have it? And a variety of other things that I'll show you where to find them in the tidy source as we dig into the actual code. So once that's happened, some people are going to talk to each other about it. And eventually, the pull request is going to get into a state where a human with the authority to say so says, yeah, this looks good to merge to me. Now, humans and robots are differently fallible. Um, humans are much better at the design decisions of should this code probably go in or not? And robots are better at nitpicking exactly when the code is ready. So the human makes the design decision, yeah, this should probably merge, looks good to me, and tells the robot named Bohr Servo, R plus, I have reviewed this positively, it looks good. Now, Bohr's Servo's purpose in life is to answer the question, will all of the tests still pass if I merge this change? And the way that Bohr's Servo does this, day in and day out, as you can see by his little commit graph, is by creating a branch that is the state that the master branch will be in after merging the change and running all the tests he can find on it. So you get your insight into how Bohr's Servo works um, by looking at the homo queue, on, which is the link to it is in the servo wiki, as many useful things are. Basically, this tells you how many pull requests um, Bohr's or homo is aware of and what state they're in. The thing that homo actually runs to get the results of those tests is going to be a set of buildbot jobs. So buildbot, I'll go into the details of um, later on when we dig into the code, happens to also be a Python utility. And it's basically for scheduling tests across different builders. So the insight that you'll get into what buildbot's doing and how it's working is the grid of the waterfall of how all these different um, builders are doing. So each column is a different builder, each colored block is how long the test took based on how long the block is and um, the name of the test. The font looks very small on here because you have to zoom out to really see the waterfall properly. It's not the best user interface if you happen to be a um, web designer looking for a challenge. Um, it would be great if you could look at how to template this in a way that makes that information available without being um, quite so challenging to work with. So anyways, BuildBot runs the tests, and they pass or they fail. Let's say the tests all pass, because you got lucky the first time or had to try again. Anyways, um, BuildBot is going to report to Homu, or Bohr's Servo. And in the pull request, Homu is going to say, I'm starting these tests, and High Five is helpfully going to jump in and update the status based on labels. And then once the tests come back, um, Homu will say, here are links to all the builders, and everything passed. And then only the robot is ever allowed to merge into the master branch. That merge will only ever happen if all the tests pass. So we managed to follow the not rocket science rule. And then at the end of this conversation, High Five comes in and does a little bit of janitoring also, because it's a very helpful little robot. And finally, once your test has landed, or once your change has landed into um, servo core, it will ship in the next nightly that we build. The nightlies are also built on BuildBot and then uploaded to Amazon S3, where then they're available on our download.servo.org um, developer preview page. Right now, we have Mac and Linux builds. There are um, some challenges working with the Windows and Android builds, getting them um, a single artifact that you can just ship and have it work. If you happen to be a Windows or Android development expert, uh, we would love to have your input and assistance getting those builds up and running. So, and that's basically the life cycle of the pull request. You hit high five, high five greets you and assigns your reviewer. Your reviewer says R plus. Um, Homo sees the R plus, kicks off some tests, sees the test results, comes back, does the right thing on your pull request. And then later on, once your change has landed, BuildBot creates a nightly artifact, including your changes. Also, 
You notice me saying Python a lot. We are, after all, at a PyCon. So I'd like to now show you a bit more about how each of these pieces works, where you can find the code, and where to start if you'd like to look at each of these moving parts. Plus a few tangents into ways that none of these Python parts would be possible without yet more Python. First off, high five, the first thing the pull request touches, our little greeter bot. Um, the code for servos high five lives at github.com slash servos slash high five. Um, the files that you care about, the readme explains how to set up the web hooks that notify high five of um, when a relevant event like a pull request creation is going on. So if you're setting up your own instance, be sure to check the webhook section of that readme. Newpr.py is the file that gets, um, is the program that gets run every time it receives the webhook, um, once you've set it up on your server with the correct ports configured. And that newpr.py will use the other helper methods and stuff to take the appropriate action based on the payload of the webhook it receives. And of course, also important are the tests. We adore new tests. If you happen to like writing tests, um, we would consider you a bit of a unicorn and um, be even happier to have you than um, somebody who throws us code without tests. So that's where to get started on High Five. Um, so the code goes through High Five, and then once it's R plus, Homu kicks off some tests. So Servo maintains our own fork of Homu. The upstream maintainer was actively developing for a while, but then circumstances changed, and he's not interested in developing as actively as we are. So we are keeping the kind of bleeding edge, all the new changes fork, and he's occasionally upstreaming um, select changes from ours. So in the homo homo directory of servo homo, you'll find the server.py and main.py. So that server is what handles all of the webhooks that homo receives. Um, also check homo's readme to see how those webhooks are set up and exactly which events he needs to be notified of in order to appropriately respond to R plus comments and to Travis successes or failures. So moving on, how's BuildBot configured? So as well as being implemented in Python, we actually had one of our amazing contributors, Anish, refactor our BuildBot configs so that you write this human readable steps.yaml in a very sensible, um, non-redundant way. And then the environments.py and factories.py are invoked when you deploy BuildBot in order to construct this giant, kind of redundant BuildBot config that can control which tests get run with which environment variables set on which machines at which times. So BuildBot proper is also, as I mentioned, a Python project. If you have wanted to write a CI framework using your Python skills, they always love extra help. Um, and when BuildBot uploads a nightly artifact to S3, sometimes something goes wrong, maybe it needs to be moved, maybe I need to remove something. My two choices as the sysadmin are to either try to navigate the AWS console web interface that has like 300 tiny icons that sometimes move around and sometimes change how they look, or I can use a command line thing. So another Python tool, just tangentially, that happens to make my life a lot easier is called Boto. You can find it on GitHub. Um, Boto slash Boto3 is the latest version. And this allows you to encant sensible Unix sounding things to a command line program and have the appropriate changes made in AWS. It's a glorious thing. If you want to make sysadmins everywhere very happy, um, check out their issue tracker and see if there's something you can help them out with. Anyways. How do you know what tests to actually run? The mock framework is a Mozilla-specific thing that runs tests for um, Gecko and for Firefox, as well as for Servo. And if you look in github.com slash servo slash servo, in the Python directory, you'll see not only tidy, but also the mock bootstrap. In the servo directory there, there are the servo-specific mock commands that we've customized so that when you say, hey, mock, test um, run this set of tests or build a nightly artifact, it'll just do the right thing because it has um, checked that directory and dug out the script for whatever you told it to do from there. Um, tidy also is a little tiny linting module that we uh, maintain because the servo code base has specific Rust coding standards like line length, licensing requirements, um, and so forth that you wouldn't necessarily want to impose on a tool like um, Rust format, 
but we do want to make sure all the licensing and stuff is consistent across, the, across Servo. So Mark itself is used by, as I said, a variety of projects, and if you'd like to get started with it, Google Mozilla Mark, because that's a long URL to write down, but MDN has a really helpful page. Um, another quick tangent into its Pythons all the way down is that if you happen to start hacking on Mark, you will find yourself in this Mercurial repo. And the relative benefits and drawbacks of Mercurial versus Git aside, if you happen to hit a bug in the version control, you can continue using your Python skills to fix it because Mercurial itself is a Python tool. So not directly related to Servo, but if any of these steps in our, um, if any of these prerequisites were implemented poorly, it would wreck the Servo build process. So finally, as we're looking at all of the different Python tools that hold Servo together, you gotta ask, how do we configure those hosts? The place where High Five runs, the place where BuildBot runs, those hosts that we really do have to manage. And the answer is we use salt stack configs. Um, we primarily use salt because we have some amazing contributors who are also um, members of the salt community who are just always there for us to help review our code and keep things moving along, keep us up to best practices with it. So as you can see, the saltfs repo has configs for basically everything on the hosts that we manage. And um, it's the repo that I showed you the buildbot configs in as well. So if you happen to feel like writing some config management, again in Python, check out saltstack.com. So for questions, since I know that was a lot of buzzwords, a lot of new terms, and I said Python altogether too many times in it. Um, high five is the bot with the four purposes, greet, assign, notify, and warn. You say hi to a new contributor, you assign the appropriate person to review the PR, you notify anyone whose modules got touched, and you warn the contributor if they seem to have made a poor decision somewhere. Homu is the bot that answers the question, will the tests pass after I merge this PR? BuildBot is what actually runs the tests, and Mach is the execution framework that, um, that controls how the tests are set up as well um, on a servo-specific basis. Boto is a very useful tool that I use to fix it when nightly upgrade updates fail. Um, Mercurial, we wouldn't have Mach without Mercurial, and Salt manages our configs for all the build machines and ties it all together. So before I actually answer the questions that I can see a bunch of people writing down, thank you for that, um, I'm also going to answer the, the question that I promised I would of where can you get started? If this all sounds pretty neat, you want to use some of these tools, or you want to start contributing to the tools, where do you go? Well, if you'd like to get involved with the Rust language, you go, I've been scripting for a long time, but I'd really like to try this systems programming thing. Um, check out rustcommunity.github.io slash resources. And this has sections of the various types of resource and should have links to everything you need to kind of find your footing and know where to go. I also have these resources printed out on the little business cards on the table by the door there. So feel free to grab one on your way out. That's what they're for. Um, if you just want to jump into writing some Python code for Servo, check out starters.servo.org. It's a little JavaScript page that an, another amazing contributor, um, definitely a theme here. We have an amazing community with people who just write these wonderful things that we full-timers would never have necessarily have time to because of our, all of our other tasks. Um, starters will let you sort through the, PR, or the issues that we have tagged as being good for your first PR. You can sort by language, you can sort by, um, you can check out which repo they're in, or you can just hit the I'm feeling lucky button, well, I'm feeling adventurous, and get a random PR, or a random issue that you can then write a PR for. So this works great. You can, you can set one of these starter sites up for your own project as well, although it relies on very diligent issue triage in order to work. So that is where I would point anybody new to Servo. Also, um, Later this week, I will be blogging the content of this talk, so you can find the links to all of our upstream or down the stack, depending on how you look at it, Python project, without which we would not be able to deliver this product the way we do. So again, there is a slides URL and contact information, and it looks like I've got about um, six minutes to take some questions.
Great, a question. How does High Five determine who owns the modules? Um, the last time I dug into High Five, it was with a, um, so we have two High Fives. One of them goes to Rust and one of them goes to Servo. And one of them uses a hard-coded list and one of them, I think, looks at who has committed the most frequently. So let's see what Servos does. Um, there's a Servo with High Five. Um, So we find what it touched, and then so yeah, we have we we have the two radically different high fives, um, and So it'll pick a random reviewer from the repo, if I recall correctly, for, um, for the assignee, and then. So this is, this is one of my problems with having um, a four or five different hats that I wear within research, is that um, all of the individual uh, projects that I code on move faster than I'm necessarily um, reviewing every change. So. No, that's the event. Um, so we actually just have them hard coded in this particular high five. Um, people can PR to this particular file in order to watch particular um, directories. So, like, the Holly is watching everything in component style, so for each, um, and we can tell why Ki Chang got CC'd on that because he's watching the directory paths that it included. So, any other questions? Okay, that's cool. Um, you're welcome again to reach out to me on any of these if you come up with a question later or are just wondering where to start with Rust. And we've got Rust stickers by the door. So thank you very much for your time.